in tonight's webinar is Evokes Family Programming. This webinar will be used for our, our new participants or maybe even our pers prospective participants. Um, so what I'd like from our, our current alumni uh, attendees this evening is I'd like you to submit any questions or thoughts you have about our programming. I'm going to talk about what we do, but I, I think importantly I'm going to talk about what is the thinking that goes on behind it. Why do we do what we do? And really what makes it evoke, in my opinion, and the Wilderness Therapy Program for Families very different from Wilderness Therapy Programs that have come before Evoke. So I'll talk about that as we go. And please submit your questions at any time to Stephanie, and she'll hold those in a queue until it's uh, time for me to read them. So the first question comes is, why parent work? I can remember many years ago, one of the things that Evoke Therapy Programs did differently is we were the first therapy programs in the country to involve families to any extent. Prior to the programs that we started in 1998, it was really about the child. You brought the child into the program, you provided the families with a half an hour phone call a week and there was virtually no other support except for a graduation ceremony at the end of the program. I was trained in marriage and family therapy as were my partners and so we had this idea that we had been taught in school that the more family support, the more capable you were of, of not only making change, but maintaining those gains going forward. So from day one, we started to invite, invite the families, involve the families in the field experience and on satellite phone, phone calls and more than one visit to the field. And we even saw a benefit very early on of parents participating in the field for the other children, for the other students and clients that were in the field. And so, uh, since so much of my work is, is teaching and educating parents, at, at one point when I was talking to parents, trying to diminish the amount of blame uh, and shame that parents feel, one father wisely asked me, he said, Brad, you constantly talk about not blaming the parents. And in the next breath, you talk about the family work that needs to be done. So why, how, how can both of those things be true? And I thought it was an excellent question, and I have developed, of course, over the last 20 years since I was asked that, I've developed a, a few aspects to that answer. My first answer back then was, if you make the changes you need to, you'll, you'll participate in your child's life going forward. That there's still some things that you can learn, and while this is not necessarily about blaming or fixing the child through you, creating a healthier dynamic that involves you, healthier and clear communication and boundaries and awareness that you develop will may help you to be a part of your lives, your, your child's healthy life going forward forever. So it, it gets you into the arena. It builds a bridge between you and your child. You get, you get on the same ground, you share common language, and there's always room for improvement. That was my early answer. Since then, I've thought about it in a couple of different ways. Number one, it's, it's a lot about family support. I'll talk about this as I go on tonight, but when I talk about family work, family teaching, parent coaching, in a lot of ways I'm talking about support. You know, in order to provide the, the support that you need to provide for your child going forward, you need support. I can remember one mother years ago asking for extra phone calls, wanting extra time, constantly wanting to go over the hour that I had allotted for her, and I was encouraging her to go to, go to therapy at home, to go take care of herself at home. And she said, I don't want to be needy. I, I don't, I don't want to be that mom. And I said, it's showing up. You need support. You need extra resources. There's no shame in that. Children that struggle with learning disabilities, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, substance abuse disorders, they need extra capacity from their parents. And, and so for any of us to think that we can go along in our life without feeding ourselves, extra when we have children that struggle with these issues we're going to end up in trouble so the the second aspect of the question is to need support it's about support it's about providing you skill skills tools awareness and insight so that you can better provide for your child the support that he or she needs doesn't necessarily guarantee any outcome the only outcome it really guarantees is that you have more confidence Clarity and Serenity. I talk about in my book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, that, that parent work doesn't change children. Parent education isn't meant to change children, but, but parent education changes parents. 
that change can have a really positive effect on children and everybody you interact with. But, but in, in a very clear way, it's important to see how is this innately helping me? I also talk about this idea that when a parent changes, their whole life has changed, right? Change in a parent, becoming a healthier parent mean, means becoming a healthier person, means becoming a better husband, wife, partner, uncle, aunt, brother, sister, grandparent, employer, employee, friend, because a healthy parent is a healthy person. And so I often don't separate out the work of those two things. And you know, one, one piece that comes for the parents that we work with is increasing that capacity, supporting them. It gives them peace in the present moment, right? When you show up with your child's crisis, and for most of you, your child is in crisis, when you show up with anxiety and frustration, disappointment and anger, when you show up with that, you can't be there for your child. And in fact, in many ways, showing up with that oftentimes invites your child to take care of you. So you go and take care of yourself somewhere else, watch the, watch the webinars, listen to the podcast, talk to your parent mentor, go to your Al-Anon meeting, go to your home therapist. You go take care of all of those real, valid, authentic, earned experiences and emotions so that you can come back and be there for your child. And I want to say one last thing, and I'll, and I'll touch on this, and this is a very, I think, sophisticated and subtle comment or idea. <clears throat> and that is this idea that so often when parents listen to the webinars, when they watch the webinars, when they listen to the podcast, when they read a parenting book, when they get off a phone call or, or, or have a phone call with their child's therapist at Evoke, when they go to their therapist at home, so oftentimes they come away with this blame. There's this feeling of, of blame and, and, and the subsequent shame. I remember last year, earlier this year, I was giving a, a lecture to some parents in Toronto, Canada. And I was trying to de-shame parents, support them, present in a non-judgmental way. And then one of the parents came up to me afterwards and said very frankly, just walked right up to me and said, I still feel blamed. And, and I thought about this for many, many years. And let's just... Pick that apart for just a moment. What if the reality was that we do dent our children? Denting our children is different than causing them to have a substance abuse disorder or causing their depression. But what if because of our, our humanness, we dent our children, we affect them? Right? What if that's true? Then, then what ought to, we to do about that? Should we lock ourselves in jail? So we have ourselves beheaded or punished or beaten? Or, or can we work on ourselves? I think an interesting aspect of the blame-shame dynamic is we can take responsibility. We can. Part of my work as a father has been in the last 25 years to realize I, I do affect, I do have a harmful, hurtful, negative effect on my children. It doesn't make me responsible for how they deal with it, but it does make me accountable for what I'm doing. Much like in the book the, 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 that I quote in my book, The Anatomy of Peace, where, where the two parents leaving a parent meeting for the first day are going into the hotel room and the wife says to the husband, I feel so badly. And the husband, in an effort to support her and feeling a bit of his own defensiveness, says, you know, sweetheart, you didn't put any drugs in our son's mouth. That wasn't your responsibility. And she looked very compassionately toward him and very clearly and said, you misunderstand completely. I don't feel bad for what our son did. I feel bad for what I did. And so learning to take on a, a responsibility and accountability without taking on responsibility and accountability for things that we haven't done, for things that are outside of our control. The reason that so many of us are then burdened and, and laden with guilt when we, when we consider the possibility that we hurt people. When, when we get overwhelmed with shame, it's because that's, that's part of our baggage. That's part of our upbringing. You can be responsible. You can know that you have, have an impact. And it doesn't necessarily have to come with a lot of shame. So I've evolved that, that, that answer over the last couple of decades to, to help parents say, take responsibility. Yes, you can do better. 
you can listen better. Yes, there are things in your relationships that are a problem, that, that are part of you, that you came by naturally or honestly, and you can work on those. And that doesn't have to come with a whole lot of shame. I think that idea is the missing ingredient in most parent education or most therapy around parenting. Because most people try to, to, to separate it out. Either you have no responsibility or you're, it's your fault. Like I said the other night, a mother, after visiting with her therapist, after sharing with her therapist about how horrible she felt for how her daughter had turned out, she said, after a while, my therapist pointed out all the positive things that I did and that I wasn't a horrific or a toxic mother. And so I realized it wasn't my fault. And then I presented this kind of gray area, this both and, this dialectic idea that, that, that seemingly opposite concepts can both be true, which is I affect my children, I dent them, I also support them, right? I also, I also buoy them up. I've given them some wonderful resources and, and support and love. And I can look at that. And, and the, the ironic thing, folks, is that when we can do battle with our shame, when we can keep it at bay, we can look at all of our stuff. We, we do more work. People that struggle and are saddled with more shame do less work, have to defend themselves, have to be told it's not your fault, you didn't do it, you're a good parent more often. Because to consider the possibility that, and it's the most important job for, for all of us, to consider the possibility that we have some contribution to our child's pain and sadness and hurt is overwhelming for us. So when I work with parents, when we work with parents, our experience is that if they do this work, it changes everything. It changes a parent and that can have a one, wonderful impact on a child. I want to say something about shame and in parent coaching. You know, there's this thing that I hear in parent coaching, parent education, parent support sometimes where people prescribe to parents certain things that they should do. You should hold this boundary. Kick your kid out of the house. Give him this consequence. Back off. I've told the story many times that when my son, my, my teenage son, I had to take him to the ER for potential alcohol poisoning because he had gotten drunk during the school day. I, I arrived and he was seen by the, the, the doctors and then they sent a social worker to talk to me. Social worker to talk to me. And the first thing she said is, you need to be more vigilant. You need to watch your son. You need to pay attention more. And I said, she didn't know me. And I said, well, wait a second. I, I drug test my kid all the time. In fact, I, I have access to the best drug kit drug testing kits in the country that I know of because I've been doing this for so many years. I also have a breathalyzer, a professional grade breathalyzer that I ask my son to blow in when he goes out or hangs out with friends or is, is out over, on the weekend. In fact, that's probably why he got drunk during the school day is because he thought he could get away with it. I've organized community groups, talking groups in with neighbors to talk about what our, our children are going through. I go to therapy. I have been for more than a decade at the time. On and on and on, I went through this list of things that I was doing. And then the social worker said to me, you need to back off. And I said, so which is it? Because a minute ago, you were telling me I need to do more. Now, you're needing to, now I need to do less. So you tell me what to do. You give me, and, I, and at this point, I was frustrated and angry. You give me the equation. You give me the step-by-step -step that if I do perfectly, my son or daughter will turn out perfectly. Because you know what? I'm a parent educator. I run a program. I'm a wilderness therapist. And when you give that list to me, I'm going to gladly give it to all of my parents. She apologized, of course. She got one thing right in that. And that was there was a part of me thought that I can control it one way or the other. So the control came through. But the point that I wanted to make with that story is this idea that when therapists give you a prescription, when they give you an assignment, a, a, a recommendation, and the implication is if you do this, it's guaranteed to work. It's really just shaming you in a very clinical and sophisticated way. So 
Our work at Evoke is to help you understand the question, the principles involved, right? It's learning to throw a ball without trying to aim it. And ironically, when you throw a ball without trying to aim it and you trust your throw, you become more accurate. I, I think all of us can relate to, to an activity where getting tense and anxious, afraid of outcomes, causes us to lose our, our capacity, our skill. But, but practice and awareness and execution with a great deal of trust increase our capacity and our efficiency in a certain task. It happens in sports, music, art. You know, fear is the enemy of art. There's a great story that I read in a book called Art and Fear, where the, the professor in the ceramics course divided the class on the first day of class into two groups. This side of the room, this side of the class, were going to be graded only on the quantity of their finished pieces. So literally, the professor was going to put all of the finished art, all of the finished ceramics on a scale and, and grade them accordingly. On the other side of the room, they were all going to be graded on one piece, one finished piece. And so the semester went on, and at the end of the semester, the, this professor graded accordingly. And this, the professor made this observation, which I think is profound. The observation was that all of the greatest pieces of art were in the group that, that was graded on bulk, whereas the group that was graded on one piece was, was, less, was, was a, a, a poorer quality. The conclusion that the professor came up with was that when people were free, not afraid, right? Just free to, to act and create, that they did well. When people were afraid or tense and there was that pressure on them, they did worse. My son, who's an art student in college, his professor walked up behind him and observed that he was marking his canvas tentatively. And after a moment, she asked him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm, I'm really happy with the piece so far, but I'm afraid I'm going to ruin it. And then the professor said to him, now your assignment is to ruin this. Keep painting until you ruin it. And she was aware that fear is the enemy of creativity. In sports, it's the, it's the enemy of, of effectiveness and talent. Music, art. You think about giving a public speech. When you're afraid, sure, a little bit of anxiety can be motivating. But anything more than a little can be overwhelming. overwhelming. The same goes true in parenting. That's why it's our job to manage and take care of our anxiety. So that when we're parenting, we're coming forward with our best self. Most people in therapy, let alone parent, parent education, are, are busy asking the question, what do I do? Right? And I talk about this in my book. This is the foundation of my book. That's not the right question to ask. The right question to ask is, who am I? What's my truth? What am I hoping for? What's my long-term goal? Who is my child? What's their problem? What's their relationship? Those kinds of questions. You know, a, a parent coach, a therapist that can help you go through those kinds of questions then provides you with a, a long-term aspect of support, which is you become the expert. You learn the right question to ask. Because it's not about what you do. I talk about it in my book, this, uh, this example of a parent who was asked by their, their, their son to bring out cigarettes at the end of the program. They were over 21. They were going to a program where smoking was allowed. And, and they said, what should I do? And it's a longer story than that. But I, I basically said, look, I can imagine you coming out with the cigarettes, handing them over to your child and saying, I'm not responsible for your smoking. You know how I feel about smoking, but it's not my job. I could also imagine you showing up at his transition and saying, I'm not responsible for your smoking. I can't control it, but I'm not going to participate in bringing it to you. Either way works. Because the fact of the matter is, if we think it's our job to engineer a situation that guarantees outcomes, we can't get it right. 
on the on the contrary if we come from a place of authenticity curiosity patience awareness confidence right that comes from all of that serenity surrender i could go on and on it's impossible to get it wrong no matter what you do and the action doesn't define the effectiveness of the parent that's what we learn in Al-Anon and Codependence Anonymous and Families Anonymous. These are groups that are set up. These are set up for people who have family members that are self-sabotaging, that are alcoholics and drug addicts, that chronically can't get it right. And so what do they learn? They learn to focus on themselves, on their side of the street, on what they can change. And yes, that change in them is more positively impactful. But it falls just short of cause and effect. So we teach you to explore the thinking. We don't blame you because you can set a boundary. You can kick your drug addicted kid out of the home and he can die. And you can keep him in the home and give him chance after chance after chance after chance and he can die. So if you think you've got to get it right so that he'll be okay, we haven't done anything for you. We've just sharpened your defenses. So understanding and ask, asking yourself about motives and goals. Yes, there are skills and tools, but, but they can only be effectively used in the context of the kind of awareness that we talk and that we teach about at, at Evoke. Let's talk about some of the things we do and then I'll talk about some more principles. Of course, these webinars are, are broadcast. We try to broadcast them twice weekly. They're live, so you can ask questions, make comments. You have a, a lifetime membership to the webinars. So as long as we're doing this, as long as I'm alive and doing these, you have a lifetime membership. And we have families that attend from five, ten years ago. We have about 150 archived webinars. We'll, we'll, that, that will continue to build. Variety of topics. We're open to suggestions, topics or questions. These webinars are also available on, on podcasts, so I'm recording it right now. So when we're done with the, pod, with the webinar, it takes me a little bit of time, but I, I convert them into a podcast, and they're available the next day on the podcast app on an iPhone or on the SoundCloud app on an Android device. So you can listen to those on your, on your mobile devices when you're running, driving in the car, riding the train. We have parent coordinators. Those are folks in the office that are specifically assigned to you that you can call for any of your daily questions and guidance, navigating the portal, assignments, letter writing, birthday, birthdays, um, other aspects and logistics around visits and so forth. We have parent mentors. These are former parents who have volunteered and been vetted by our therapist to speak to you from a parent-to-parent -parent perspective. Right? They can offer you something a little bit different than any, any professional. And just to know, I, I want to say this as clearly as I can, you are not alone. You're not alone. Your neighbors, your community, they're all over the place. And so connecting you with people that, that are from that are from the community is one way to remind you. They can kind of hold your hand through the process. These are available to every family. So if you have a problem connecting with your parent mentor, talk to your parent coordinator. We have a parent portal with, with assignments. They have writing assignments, reading assignments. Also on the parent portal, there are group journals. The letters will be posted. Pictures can be posted there. Sometimes pictures are sent directly to you. Sometimes they're posted on the portal. So the parent portal is a, is a vast array of, of resources. And each week, new assignments come up. And, and therapists have the ability to, to tailor those to you and to change those. But that's kind of our core curriculum. You, of course, have a weekly phone call with a therapist where, in my opinion, they help facilitate some of the most effective family therapy I've ever seen in my life. And I'm a family therapist. And that is walking you through a, a family therapy session through letter writing. It's slow. It's deliberate. You can pause. You can delete. You can rewrite. You can think about it. You can see it in black and white. You can listen and take time before you have to respond. And because it's not an immediate in-the-moment response, you start finding access to your source, your truth, your center. 
instead of measuring and trying to control their reactions, which so many of us do, which is so much a part of codependency, right? We measure, we read other people, we try to control how they feel, what they think, whereas letter writing requires you to, to write it and then let it go and send it off and then you wait a few days for a response. Phone calls from the field with your child. You know, when we first started doing phone calls, at first we thought of it like, this is all about earning it. This is all about when they get to a certain point and phone calls happen in the early days toward the end of the program. But it was good practice. Now, it's part of the work, right? It's part of the, the, the mid-program work. We definitely want to get to a place where they're not going to use the, pro, the, the phone call to just beat you up like they were at home, right? That's already been done. That's why they're here. But we don't expect them to be perfect. We expect it to be an opportunity for the therapist here to work with you live in vivo, to coach, to process afterwards, to process afterwards with, with your child instead of all of it being, being done by historical report and through letter writing. So phone calls from the field facilitated by the therapist are effective. Having program visits throughout the program, mid-program visits and end-of-program visits. Let me tell you this. I was told by an educational consultant years ago, which we were the first and only program to do it at the time, that they were, they, they created a, a kind of an anti-climax for families, that that end-of-program visit that was such a wonderful reunion was less dramatic less climactic. And at first I was defensive. But then I realized she's right. It is anticlimactic. And that's what, not what we're trying to create. Climactic reunions at the end of the program don't serve anyone really well. Yes, it's wonderful and it feels great and tears and hugs and glad to see you. That's all wonderful and beautiful. But, but visiting during the program and, after, and at the end of the program, that can be very effective to just help you see what real life looks like because Tuesday mornings aren't climactic. Saturday at 2 o'clock isn't climactic. And after a while, that reunion shine, glow, wears off and, and, we get, and it has to get real. We have weekend parent workshops that we ask all parents to come to if at all possible. They're available every six weeks or so at one of our locations. Sometimes then that means it'll happen early in your stay. Sometimes it'll happen in the middle or end of your stay. We ask if you possibly can to come to those. It's an opportunity to, to learn from the Evoke staff and therapist and to get a better idea of what your child is doing. So there's experiential activities. You'll learn how to bust a fire, for example. You might learn how to tie, uh, set up a shelter or a tarp. Multifamily, so that means that many families are there so you can learn from other people, get feedback from other people. And I have found, and of course, been doing this for many years, that you get as much out of the work watching somebody else do something as you do your own work. And then if it's appropriate, check with your therapist. You, you combine that, that weekend parent with a parent visit. So on the end of it, then you would go out and see your child. And of course, that has to be clinically appropriate in terms of timing with your therapist at Evoke. We try to provide regional support groups all over the country at most of the, the, the major areas that we, we get our clients from, but we also just try to extend beyond that. So Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, and New York are the ones that we visit most often, and then we visit other ones around the country too, Seattle, Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, um, Denver, Orange County. We try to visit others when we can also. So there's that connection. And, and parents come, like I said, like with the webinars, they come years and years later. If you want to go further than the basics of what we provide, you can also participate in a, in a four-day intensive for either individuals or for families. These are therapeutic intensives where you work on psychodrama, your own family of origin work, communication skills, codependency, anxiety, conflict, communication. We teach mindfulness and meditation, and we also provide an incredibly cathartic and instructional four-day therapeutic intensive, something that I participated in many years ago and that I wanted to create at Evoke. So we do those now 
in a cabin in Park City. We can also do, we have those scheduled monthly for individuals. We call it Finding You. And then you can also schedule a private family intensive for any number of your family members. And we can design one especially for you. Parent coaching is available. That's telecoaching before and, and after Evoke. So our master's level and PhD level therapists can do the same kind of parent coaching that you got during the program, after the program, or before the program, depending upon where you are. So you can maintain that. That's available, of course, as an add-on. We ask you to go to Al-Anon, CODA, or Families Anonymous. That's a free service that we don't run, but you can go to the websites. I'll talk about that again at the end. And then, of course, we ask you to go to a home therapist. So what's the difference at a vote? Part of it is the comprehensive offering. That's a part of it. Part of it is that um, there's a depth to it, that it's not cookie cutter. It's not a step by step. We go beyond what should I do to the important questions. And I will tell you this, it's not often that, that a therapist will help you process and learn how to think about the question. The therapist that simple gives simple advice and simple directives without understanding the concepts, the motivations, the relationships, beneath all of that, isn't providing the evoked difference. Wilderness therapy then and now, in the early days, like I said, none of this was available. It was not a family program. We're still the only program that I know of that offers webinars and podcasts at this level and some of the other services. But it was something that we thought, you know, we saw wilderness therapy as effective before we started our program. Maintaining the gains is the thing. Maintaining the changes. And the most, for me, the most important thing to helping clients and students maintain gains is providing the, the parents with this kind of support and education. Because we don't want to inadvertently, and we do this as parents, we don't want to inadvertently reinforce things that we don't want to see continue. We don't want to be a part of a negative process and dynamic. Right? We don't want to participate in the pathology. We don't want to dance with it. So getting out of it, changing ourselves is the best contribution that we can maintain. And that's a lifelong process. It's a smorgasbord. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's like getting a drink from a fire hose. And we recognize that. We don't want to overload you. We want to provide you with as much as possible, but not to be overwhelmed. So you can talk to your therapist about that. I get the question all the time, what is your work? Your work is to figure out, I think a lot of us know what to do, but we don't necessarily do it. And so the work in therapy is that space in between, I think I know what to do, and I'm not able to do it or willing to do it. And our work is inside of ourselves, right? to do our own work, to look at our own family of origin. If you have any question about that, watch or listen to the webinars, the broadcast on Parenting from the Inside Out. Read the book, Parenting from the Inside Out. Read The Journey of the Heroic Parent, of course. Read Alice Miller's book or listen to the podcast on The Drama of the Gifted Child. All of these books, and, and especially Parenting from the Inside Out, are research and evidence-based. How you've made sense of and internalized your own childhood, your own past, has a direct, everyday, powerful, profound impact on your parenting. So that's our work. Our work is our work. Make our lives our project. Don't make our child's life our project. Make our lives our project. And I will say this. If the only reason you're doing it is to help your child, that's an okay reason to start. For most people, what, what therapy starts off as is what it becomes later on. What is not your work? Working harder than the child. And what I mean by that is this idea that if you work hard enough, that you do enough, that, that you're going to show them and they're going to be motivated and you can make up for it and you can't. Do your work. Do what you feel comfortable with. But if you think, if I do enough of my work, then the child will get better and stay better, that's not the way that it works. You do your work for, for its own sake. You do it because it changes you. You do it because it gives you new eyes and new ears. You do it because it gives you peace in the present moment, even in the face of difficult and, and crises, times. 
You do it because it changes everything in your life. And if you're new to the program, give it some time. I have so many people say to me, I don't know what you're talking about. You don't make sense. Some people even say they don't like me. And then weeks or months later, they come and they say, it all makes sense now. I hear it now. Start now. Don't wait. Start now. Take one step at a time and don't wait. I like to say, assume that nobody else in your family will change. So what are you going to do about it? And the only thing you're left with is what's inside of your control, your side of the street, as they say in al -Anon. So assume that nobody's going to change. And so what are you going to have to do? What skills, what tools, what kind of patience, what kind of flexibility, resiliency are you going to have to develop? And then lastly, the idea that you're only as happy as your, as your least happy child is part of the problem. You can find, even the case of crisis, serenity and clarity in the present moment. How is it possible not to feel shame when we're supposed to know better? We're the ones who are supposed to be in charge. It's a, it's a good question. I, I suppose I would, I would challenge this idea that you're supposed to know better. According to whom? You know, I, I've, I've worked with parents for a lot of years now, and here's the deal. If you're supposed to know better, right, you're supposed to be a better parent, right? You're, you're the cause of the problem. Let, I have two ways of answering. Let's say that you are. Then what are you going to do about it? How about just work on it? Why? Well, shame doesn't help. But, but, but if that's true, then aren't your parents responsible for your issues? I remember when I was meeting with my, my, my pastor years ago when I was going through my divorce 20 years ago. And he said to me, I had two young children at the time, and he said to me, I was the one who wanted a divorce, and he said, you're going to be responsible for your son and daughter's sins. They're going to be on their head because of this decision. And I thought about that for a moment. I said, well, I think I'm off the hook because my parents were divorced too, and my dad was kind of a jerk. And of course, I was being a little bit sarcastic, but the idea is I have wounds. You're human. You have wounds. You have de deficiencies. You have limitations. And knowing it, folks, if knowing it is the answer, if you think knowing it is the solution, it's not. If knowing it is the answer, I'd be a perfect parent. Because for sure, I have a PhD in this stuff, and I've been a parent educator for 24 years, right? You shouldn't have to need to know more than that than to make it your entire life study and to get a doctorate degree in it. So if knowing it is all that it's about, I would be a perfect parent. You can interview all four of my children. They will gladly tell you that I'm nowhere near a perfect parent. It is so hard not to shut down, to stay present, and to teach my child something I've never learned. Show up not knowing. Show up confused. Show up not having their answer. Show up scared. I was just doing, finishing an intensive today, and I was talking about this idea a parent was going to go out into the field and visit their daughter today and I was just explaining to them that you know what one of the greatest gifts that you can give is show up with your own fear and anxiety I mean not not handing it to them but saying I don't know I had a young woman tell me call me years ago her 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 brother was had graduated from our program was in treatment parents had been working with me she had not talked to him or hadn't talked to me and she wanted to have one phone call because she was going out to visit him at his therapeutic program and she was the good child. She was the one that met, never made any mistakes. And she said to me, you know, I'm scared that I'll make a mistake. I'm scared that I'll screw it up. I'm scared that I'll say something that'll set him back. Can you coach me about what to say? And I said, just say that. Just say all of that. And, and she couldn't do it. And I said to her, wouldn't it be nice for your brother to know the perfect child doesn't know everything? Wouldn't it be nice for him to know? that you were worried and scared about screwing up and that he wasn't the only screw up in the family? I was talking to my therapist. I go to therapists, have been for most of my life, have been this, for this, with this one for 18 years. And I was, I was working with a family that, that I've worked with for years and I was, they were, had a really, really tough question, a really difficult dilemma. And I considered all the possible angles, avenues, answers. And they'd worked with me long enough to know that I wasn't going to give them simple advice or directives or promise outcomes if, if they followed a certain path but I was even worried just about the process and, and were they listening was I listening enough and 
was their child safe and, 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 and so forth and so on. So I went to my therapist to share this dilemma. And I said, I just don't know. And she said, perfect. Go back to them and tell them you don't know. That's the greatest gift that you can give them. So this idea that we have to get it right and know everything, that's part of the problem. You don't. You can't. You do not know everything. So you show up human. You show up vulnerable. In my book, I talk about being an idiot parent. You show up with your human idiot self. You do the best you can. You'll have to make choices. But you learn that it's not about getting it right. It's about getting it real. Most people think they have to get it right. And really, the only thing we can do is just be as honest, authentic, and genuine as we can. My son is in the young adult program. Are the family goals different from the adolescent program? Our therapist talks a lot about helping our son become more independent for our family and be less enmeshed. It is frequently the case that parents don't have a field visit. There are slight differences. They often have a field visit in the middle of the program for young adults and not at the end. Because we want them, or they have it prior to the end. Because we want the young adult to kind of take on the responsibility for their next step. There, there are many, many core principles that are the same. There are some logistical decisions that are different. But becoming less enmeshed, enmeshed is not, is not positive by definition. Enmeshment, by definition, is not healthy. So we're, we're working to help all parents become less enmeshed. I talk about this in the book in terms of uh, healthy attachment and detachment. We talk about, in recovery, we talk about healthy detachment, being detached in a healthy way from your child. That's, that's less than meshed. What I figured out years ago was that attachment, healthy attachment, is synonymous to healthy detachment. It doesn't feel like that, but it is. And so the, a healthy relationship is the same with, I, I have young children, I have adult children, I have a wife, of course. And, and the fact of the matter is the core principles of, of relationship and enmeshment are, are, are true across all of my relationships. And once, once I, when I'm in the principle, well, I can see how they apply to everything. All right, let's go through some announcements. We want all parents to attend six 12-step support groups while the child are with us. Those are the websites you can go to, alanon.org. Coda.org, familiesanonymous.org. You can also go to nami.org, where you can find free resources, free resources and classes. The podcasts, like I said, are available on the on your iOS or Apple devices by going to the podcast app and searching Evoke Therapy Programs. If you have an Android device, download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at evoketherapy.com and Facebook search Evoke Therapy Programs. That's not just about playing on social media. That's where you can find also announcements, articles that are important. Sometimes our, our emails, even though you're on our list until you tell us you don't want to be for life, um, sometimes people find announcements for parent support groups, activities, workshops, and so forth on our on our Twitter, Instagram, and, and our Facebook page. You can go to the Second Nature Alumni Foundation on Facebook. That's an organization that we participate in that helps people that can't afford therapy afford it. And then, of course, you can go to our blog. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon right now. The main warehouse is empty, but if you go to Alternative Buying Options, you can buy a new copy beneath there. It'll be uh, restocked here in the next week or so. You can also go to reganarts.com or barnesandnoble.com. Reganarts is R-E-G-A-N, arts, A-R-T-S, dot com. You can also buy an audio or a CD purchase. If you go to the Parent Alumni Foundation book page through the Amazon Smiles program, you can buy books there that are recommended by a therapist and a percentage of the proceeds goes to help the foundation. The next workshop that I mentioned will be October 21st, 22nd at Cascades. That's coming up. If you're just brand new, maybe you'll, you'll wait for the November 18th and 19th at Entrada. Contact Gail at evoketherapy.com for more information or to RSVP. We just finished the Finding You today. The next Finding You will be November 8th through 11th. That will be the last Finding You that I for sure will be participating in. I'm training some new people. I'll be running private family intensives after that. And occasionally I'll be running a Finding You. But if you're interested in doing deeper work with me, sign up for the November 8th through 11th Finding You. If you want to learn more about Finding You or Finding Family, go to intensives or email intensives at evoketherapy.com, go to our website or call our admins. The next parent support groups that we have on the calendar are New York City. That's October 29th at 4.30 to 6.30 at the Courtyard 
New York JFK uh, Airport Marriott. And Chicago, November 16th, 6.30 to 8.30 at the Renaissance Chicago North Shore. Uh, we'll be setting more up around the country coming up here. Email andrea at evoketherapy.com for more information or to RSVP. Pursuits trips, I didn't mention that, are for um, folks who, who want fun but not he heavy therapy. That's for young adults or families anywhere in the world, in Utah, rafting, climbing, canyoneering, mountain biking, snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, trekking, anything. So pursuit trips are for that. And it's therapy light. Think of sober fun. All right. Any last questions before I wrap up? Thank you for what you said early in the discussion. We talked with my son's therapist today, and I had an aha moment that I contributed to my son's problems. I may walk the line, the fine line of helpful and, helpful and helicopter mom, we all do, by the way, but hearing you say, I shouldn't feel shame or guilt for this. I can't control how he reacts. I can only control myself. Thank you. Folks, we're in this together. You're not alone. Nobody's perfect. If somebody tells you they are and they have all the answers, that, that social worker I told you the story about, walk away slowly. If somebody tells you, you have the they have the guarantee that if you follow these steps, everything will be okay, walk away slowly. This is all of our work. And, and what's going to connect us is not our perfectionism, not our glowing wonderfulness. It's going to be, in many cases, our pain, our difficulty, our struggle. That's what's going to connect us. Thank you, folks. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'll do the next webinar. Monday we'll come out with the, the subject tomorrow. Have a great and safe weekend. Hope this is a helpful point of contact. Take care. Bye-bye.